thanks for tuning in to Telecast. Each week, we speak with TV's movers and shakers to get the latest insight and opinion on industry developments. There's a new episode every Thursday. Our website, telecast.com, includes additional exclusive feature content from TV's thought leaders. Articles are free to read. Just register on telecast.com. And while you're there, why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? Thanks again for listening. I hope you enjoy the show. Telecast, the TV industry news review. This week's show is a slightly different kind of telecast. I wanted to look into a subject that's come up time after time in conversations that I've had with a wide range of indies over the past few months and years. And that's the subject of IP and format theft disputes between producers, broadcasters and streamers. It seems to be an issue that's always been around, the idea that a producer pitches a programme idea to a commissioner and after an initially enthusiastic reception, they find that interest starts to wane and then disappears, only to discover that their original idea is actually being remade by the broadcaster elsewhere. So I wanted to find out if this is really a common issue in the UK industry, what happens in these kind of disputes, how they arise, the impact on the producer, and what can be done about it in the future. So I've managed to have a chat with three prominent UK independent producers who each have their own stories to tell. But understandably, they wanted to do so anonymously. And that perhaps illustrates part of the problem here. I also get the perspective of Jonathan Code, one of the content industry's leading IP lawyers, and John McVeigh, CEO of UK independent producers body, Pact. So it's all coming up on this week's Telecast. So a good place to start, I thought, was to catch up again with TV format creator and presenter, Tim Shaw. Hello, Tim. How are you doing? Hi, Justin. Happy New Year. You all right? Happy New Year to you. We're still saying that in February, but that's the, <laughs> this is good. Yeah, this is good. Thanks for coming on the show. And for those who aren't aware of your disagreement around a TV format, we featured this back in uh, November, mm. I think it was. Could you briefly summarise your recent experience with The Greatest Snowman? I uh, came up with a format with my partner called The Greatest Snowman three years ago, and it went through to paid development. It was nerd at the time, uh, Red Arrow, CPL, those sort of guys, went into paid development with Channel 4, which was something we're over the moon about. It was a show called The Greatest Snowman, which was celebrities uh, out in, you know, in the Alps building snowmen, you know, sort of various ice sculptures and this, that and the other, with a selection of celebrities doing that. Anyway, what happened from then on was, unfortunately, the idea sort of faded away with them. It was something which was going so well. The channel were, as we heard, ecstatic about, you know, I remember um, getting a call from John at Nerd saying, wow, Tim Hancock, one of the guys at Channel 4, was literally, he's never seen an idea land like this. And he said, Tim, this is going to happen. This is a slam dunk. Anyway, unfortunately, for one thing or another, we actually never heard back from Channel 4 as to why they didn't commission it, which was harsh. But anyway, it faded out. And one thing led to another and it didn't get made. However, um, a few months ago, uh, my phone started binging and people were saying, congratulations, well done, the greatest snowman's being made. What are you talking about? An idea with the same name and 11 points of what I can only call uh, identical similarity. In fact, the whole, the whole thing, really, there was no difference, uh, has been made by a different production company, South Shore. I text those people back saying, I really don't know what you're talking about. But as as I say, it unfolded as being somebody else's idea uh, on the same channel. Also a 90 minute one of special for Channel 4, not made by the production company that I had the idea go through as a paid development format. So that was a great shock. And that was what you and I last chatted about. It was in Broadcast Magazine. It made you know, reasonable news and a lot of chatter in the broadcasting world as being one of those things that was just jaws on the floor. There was like 11 format points that were similar across both these ideas. Uh, I'm a sort of relatively logical person. If you apply a sort of mathematical equation to the chances of that, you know, a dice has six sides on it. So there are only six possibilities when you roll a dice. If you have 11 dice and roll them or die, whatever it is, uh, if I had the same number and as, as you, it's pretty much, you know, 100 million to one, the chance of that happening. The same numbers landing on the same dice. Now, it's not as clean cut as that, but it gives you a sort of, 
rough idea of the chances of that happening. Because there's often, in this television world, there's often this, oh yeah, we had a very similar idea, you're not going to believe, with the same name, it's happening somewhere else at the same time. Now, as a product designer, I know that when you come up with an idea, there is a good chance, and you have to live in a world that somebody else is coming up with a similar idea somewhere else. That is just what happens in life. But that's one idea, not 11 at the same time. So that was the bit that I always struggled with um, and the bit that I think was something that people took to. And I've had so many people approach me and talk to me about it and, and congratulate me on talking about it. It was one of those things that, yeah, I was people were trying to shut me down on it. But in my mind, there's the right thing and then there's the wrong thing. And I was just doing the right thing. I was just being I was just telling the world what happened, honestly. Not really with emotion or opinion, just hear the facts, make your own mind up. Now, I haven't pointed any fingers and gone, you've done this, you've done that. You have to remember, if, if it is 100 million to one or 100 to one or 1,000 to one, there is still that one. So there is that possibility that it happened, but it's very slim. And I just wanted an explanation from Channel 4. Hi, Tim, this is what happened. I'm sorry it happened to you, but you're going to have to move on. I never heard back from Channel 4. They never engaged with me at all. They sort of brushed it, you know, they did a bit of a Boris thing. Let's not talk about it. Let's it'll go away. And actually, over the passage of times, things do fade. Emotions do fade. People get over things. And I'm a busy guy. I'm filming four or five days a week. I'm building a house. My wife and I, the whole damn thing ourselves. So we're so busy. And I, I said to her, look, Christmas wasn't the best in our house. It was a bit of a painful time, particularly as the idea ultimately had come from a conversation between my wife and her daughter and I anyway long story cut short we decided to move on so I said look I'm going to send an email through my agent to Ian Katz offering you know just I'm going to be a man about this I'm going to stand up and I'm going to say listen Ian hi let's not talk snowman here's my olive branch could we have a sit down and have a conversation about a cracking new creative idea that I've got for Channel 4 because if one thing's clear Channel 4 needs some really creative ideas at the moment I thought I've got a belter here and I got a reply from Ian Katz, which I'll read you. And it says, hmm, I didn't love being called an ideas thief by him. So I can't say I'm in a rush to sit down with him. So that was my reply from the chief content officer of Channel 4. And it's hard to read that back without me sounding like an eight-year-old schoolboy that's been told off. You know, I, I, I'm sorry if it came across that way. I didn't, I didn't mean for it to, but I can't read it without it sounding like that. And that's the reply I had from Channel 4, and that, that had a big impact on me. That's, that's helped me, actually, with, with what I want to do with the idea. So the show was broadcast yeah. before Christmas, and you've reached out to Channel 4 to, to try, and, uh, try and move things along. Just to move on, yeah. Do the right thing. You had that response. So what's the current situation now, then, and, and how do you think you'll come to a resolution? Do you know what? For me, this was never, has never been about a money thing. I've never been driven by money. It's not who I am. I, I kind of wish I was. I'd be living in a mansion somewhere. It's just not who I am. I just wanted this. I wanted to do the right thing. And it was something that I thought, although it's not the right thing, I was prepared to let it go until I got that reply from the, the, the number two of this organization that I've dedicated so much of my life to, having grown up in the 90s, dreamt of working for and have done. And upon getting that email, as I say, what it really helped me realize is that I don't want to work for them anymore. I, that's not, I, I need to respect the, the, the senior people at wherever I work. That's just the way I'm built. So I, I, I called back a solicitor who has been calling me, you know, a big IP solicitor in London who knows what's going on, who's looked into it, who's talked to broadcast and is keen to see this through. Well, they want to use this as a case where, look, if ever there was a strong case, you know, you can't stand there and go, well, no, that was coincidence. Yeah, and that one, and that, and that 11 times. Somebody's going to go, hang on a minute, let's talk about this. So he's keen to pursue this, which, you know, I, I'm prepared to do. But for me, what's more important is, OK, there's pursuing it. And why would I pursue it? Well, I pursue it for money. I'm not bothered. Great. You know, it's not that I'm wealthy. It's just that it's not about money to me. It's just about honesty. It's about having a an answer. That's what I feel I'm wor worthy of. You know, an answer from somebody who I have provided so much blue box content for um, for the last ten years. It'd be nice just to have a high, just a you know, just a high. We know we've sort of employed you and we've benefited from shows that you've done, and we just we we feel you're right. We owe you an answer, but to be ignored, you know, in in that way is something which is kind of a bit of a bitter pill to swallow. So I can move on from it and. Whether or not that's the right thing to do or not, I don't know. But the solicitor is saying, let's go for it. So I'm prepared, to, and I am in the process of going down that road. And I'm doing it for 
the people who work in the industry. I'm doing it for the creatives. I'm, I'm doing it. And, I, and if, if any money comes from Channel 4, I will split it all happily between every creative out there who's ever felt that they've had an idea taken. Well, I reached out to Channel 4 to get their response to Tim's points. And this is what they had to say. We are respectful of the IP of production companies and the ideas they bring, although this is not an uncommon idea for a Christmas programme. In this instance, the ideas were brought to different teams at different times and developed separately. This particular case is unusual in the sense that Tim decided to go public and air his grievances via the press. But there appear to be many more disputes that never get to see the light of day. So I reached out to some experienced UK indie producers who also have stories to tell, all under condition of anonymity. Their stories all concern different broadcasters. My first producer guest, a really experienced and respected player in the UK industry, let's call her Jackie, which is not her real name, told me of her experience. So, yeah, I've been around a while and I do know that these things happen and a lot of us have ideas at the same time and there is a zeitgeist from which we all feed from. So often one of the greatest ways of securing a commission is to ensure we have access and have proof of that access, ideally on tape. So we had access to a brilliant, brilliant national treasure and an idea that this person was attached to and we've invested time and effort working with said national treasure and also spent a day filming with them as a brilliant taster tape. So we actually hired a crew, we had editors. We put a lot of time and effort into producing this taster tape to prove the access to prove the passion and prove the worth of the idea. We took it to a terrestrial broadcaster in the UK and the commissioner loved the idea and loved the access to the national treasure, which we had proven by said taster tape. They took it to the channel controller and later that day, unfortunately, we got a very lovely, very lovely no. And they are thinking of something in the space, but not quite that. The very next day, the National Treasure, their agent, received a phone call from the house production company within that broadcaster asking if they would be interested in doing a series on the subject that we had pitched. I mean, clearly our National Treasure was confused because it wasn't us who was talking to them, it was somebody else, but also it's the same channel. To their credit, they did actually turn it down and said that they didn't feel comfortable doing it and going ahead with it and the channel did the series with somebody else. So in a nutshell, that's it. We had a brilliant taster tape. We had great access. It didn't happen in the end in the way that we had envisaged it, but that was because our talent decided against the offer. I think for starters, we were flabbergasted. We couldn't quite believe it because, as I said, we do know the rules of the game. We do know that so many people have so many ideas and commissioners get pitched them, you know, on a daily basis. So we thought we had gone and filmed the taster tape and because we'd secured this brilliant access, we'd be okay. So I don't think we could quite believe the blatant nature of this. So yeah, flabbergasted and then angry, but also resigned because it's not surprising and this does happen and this happens all over the industry. So really flabbergasted, but not surprised. We did mention it to the commissioner who did apologise However, we didn't take it further because it's not really worth it. We want to work in relationship with the channel going forward. We really like the channel, actually, and it produces brilliant content. So it is in our interest, both commercially and creatively, to keep up good relations. I think it's a learning lesson and being slightly more cautious in the future. There's no way that you would take it that far to a legal situation because it's all about relationships as business. It's all about reputation. So you don't really want to have that reputation of an awkward producer. You want to be seen as the best producer to work with and the best people to work with. And so in something like this, if we'd complain too much, I think it'd 
was worth making just a small point. But if we'd complained too much, that would have ruined our reputation going forward. And I don't really think that it's true resolution. It's based on honour and integrity, which the TV industry needs to uphold. And I think the acceptance that everybody does have ideas, and I'm sure there are so many days where commissioners get 10 ideas, which are the same thing because everybody read the same newspaper article. So I think they're only human beings and they need to be as honest and truthful with producers as possible, you know? Like, I've got 10 other ideas like this. <laughs> However, I I don't think any particular legal route, unless it's a very, very advanced format, wouldn't necessarily work. So I think it's up to the individuals within the industry to be as honest and as truthful as they can about how they're processing and dealing with all the ideas. So that sounds pretty blatant and quite concerning that the producer didn't feel able to raise it with the broadcaster for fear of being painted as awkward. Interesting and honourable of the talent there to walk away from that one. Here's another producer, let's call him Calvin, with his story. Yeah, one of my experiences of having been the potential victim of IP theft was pitching an idea to a network where we'd attach the talent and build an idea around that talent and actually came up with a title which was a pun on the talent. And then we went to this television conference and we saw a massive poster with the same network and the same idea with the same title, but a different talent. But, you know, obviously there's, look, there's loads and loads of people pitching the same things. But the giveaway for us was they kept the pun from the last talent as a title and didn't even bother to change it. It was quite jarring to see, you know, look, but these things happen. Well, when you've been in development for 20 years or more, you know that people have the same ideas at the same time. It happens. But what was kind of disappointing was the idea we were pitching had got very, very far. You know, it wasn't just like an unsolicited email. It wasn't a cold call. And what was disappointing is that our contacts at the channel hadn't bothered to let us know that they'd actually commissioned the show with the same title and the same idea but with someone else at the helm and someone else producing it, you know, sometimes that communication from the channel is the least you can ask for. You know, when you're still a production company or a producer who's still got to have a career of pitching ideas and having good relationships with channels, it's very, especially if you're not, you know, one of the bigger indies, it, it's very risky to do that because, you know, look, I'm not a lawyer. But, you know, in, in my experience of people feeling like this, it's so hard to prove there was any sort of theft. It's an easy way out to bat it off as, well, we got pitched the same thing at the same time, which probably 99% of the time is true. But, you know, in this situation, with the title being the same and that title something we'd come up with to affect the talent that we pitched was a bit, well, let's say disappointing. But I don't think there's many smaller producers out there who would go down that legal path because it's just not worth it to get the reputation that you're going to and destroy your reputation with the network. I I think 99% of commissioners and networks would never do it. They'd never do it full stop. But anyone who was inclined to maybe, you know, use an idea or take an idea from someone, it's, it's, it's much more likely that the smaller producer will be the the victim of it because they they represent less risk because of exactly what I said before that they can't and won't pursue that it, you just don't have the money or the resources or the ability to take that risk and you know potentially lose relationships with the network well i can only speak about unscripted which is where i work but you know it's tough because when you're pitching ideas unscripted ideas you're kind of trying to pitch things that are in the ether and whether that's diet shows or gardening shows or, you know, true crime shows. And because you're working in unscripted and non-fiction space, everyone's running around pitching the same things. And so you have to, over the years, realise that the thing that you thought was the, the light bulb moment, the genius idea is probably being had all over the country by different producers or who are chasing the same kind of stories that are in the ether. What I can say is, I think the channels at the very least have an obligation to keep you informed. You know, 
if your idea has got to a certain stage, yeah, look, if you've just sent an unsolicited idea into a network or an email that they didn't ask for, you have to accept that you don't have a leg to stand on in terms of claiming that your IP was was stolen. But if you have worked with a commissioner and developed an idea, got involved, taken it to the next stage, maybe got into funded development even, at the very least, I think they should make you aware that in communication that someone else has come in and, and you know, there's something else happening. I've had positive experiences with that before where channels have phoned me up and said, just to let you know, something similar has come in from a different department or I want to make you aware that X, Y, Z. And I think that's what is often the most disappointing thing is if you just see it on a poster, you kind of feel like, oh, hold on. I just did six or seven months of work with that channel and now I'm looking at it from someone else. And maybe it was coincidence, but I think they should at least be telling the producers before they're making posters. So it seems that the producers I spoke with readily accept that there is the potential to be pitching the same idea to the same channel when they're dealing with the zeitgeist and topics and stories that audiences are following. So maybe there's a grey area here to be considered too. But again, it seems the key consideration for the indie is not to make a fuss, resign themselves to being more careful in the future and move on. But surely that kind of relationship can't be great for creativity on either side of the equation. If you're a channel or a streamer that gets a reputation of taking ideas and passing them on to their own preferred producers, surely that reputation is going to get around the production community pretty quickly. Here's our third indie producer, let's call them Don, with another story of dubious dealings by a broadcaster. So I had an idea for a show that I took into a UK terrestrial broadcaster. The pitch went really, really well. So well, in fact, that the commissioning editor said to me, could you send me the materials as soon as possible? I'll get you an answer within 24 hours on this. So I sent all the materials in. 24 hours later, true to their word, the commissioning editor called me, but the tone of the voice of the commissioning editor was very different from the voice and reaction I'd had in the room. The commissioning editor said, look, I'm really sorry, we're not going to be progressing with this any further. When I asked why, I was told we already have a very similar idea in development with another company, and they then went ahead and commissioned the other company to make the show. It turned out that the commissioning editor had formerly worked for this other company before becoming the commissioning editor at this channel. And I was obviously incredibly angry by the series of events and pointed out that why we'd been allowed to send our materials in and why had they shown such enthusiasm in the first place, only to be told that they already had something in development, which surely they could have told us about at the time. They rejected my claims, so I then wrote to the head of the channel thinking that they would see reason within my position. They then threatened me to say, you do realise that by escalating this to this level, you're jeopardising your future relationship with the channel? I did ultimately send a legal letter, and the show didn't proceed with that channel, but at the same time, my relationship with the channel was damaged, but that was not my fault. It made me feel both angry and helpless at the same time because I was 100% sure that I'd been wronged and that my idea had been stolen. But there was no judge or jury that could help defend me, and that all I could do by making a complaint about it was actually damaging my relationship with the client. Which is why, historically, people always say, even if you've got a gripe over your format being stolen, you can't win because you can't sue your clients. This happened a couple of years ago. Every broadcaster cannot really afford to not have a relationship with any producer and every producer needs a relationship with a broadcaster so there is a relationship still with that broadcaster and the people involved have moved on from the broadcaster because there's a merry-go-round within every broadcaster but it's made me more wary of the broadcaster and broadcasters in general and trying to protect myself in every way from falling into such a situation again the project that we pitched actually did end up going ahead but at another broadcaster. So the producer that we believe had plagiarised our format had been given our materials by the commissioner of one broadcaster, even though that broadcaster no longer felt comfortable proceeding. The producer who were taking our format then went and sold it elsewhere. 
and it was a flop, which in some ways gave me some comfort. But like any plagiarism or any fake, whether it be a handbag or a watch, you know, the fake is never as good as the original. And if you haven't got the instructions of how something works, it won't work as well. So it was devastating that the format got made. And on another channel, it was frustrating that we didn't even get to make our version, which we believe would have been better. How you can avoid that? Really, the only way to do that thing is to have a mediator. You know, Frapper, the Format Rights Protection Agency, does offer that service as a mediator. But what shouldn't be the case is that the broadcasters are policing their own format infringements. You would think that that would protect you. And, you know, I know that in terms of IP, people often say, you know, post yourself a letter with a date mark on it that you know with your treatment in it that will protect you. Unfortunately, in terms of format copyright, as far as I'm aware, you could have a singing show with swiveling chairs and it could be just like the voice. But if you change one element of that format, it's not the same format. So in terms of format infringement, your format can be almost 99% identical to another show. But if there's certain elements, even smaller elements that are different, that's why most format copyright legal cases fail. Because unless it's a direct copy or a direct ripoff, you won't be successful. So what is the legal position here for indies who think they've had their idea taken? Here's Jonathan Code, renowned IP lawyer. So, Jonathan... Have you been involved in many disputes over IP and TV format ideas in the industry? Well, I have a, a great number over over at least 20 years now. It was just my very good fortune to be in the right place at the right time. I was the fighting um, disputes lawyer for ITV when they were sued by those who, uh, who created the Survivor format. And they claimed that I'm a Celebrity Get Me Out of Here was essentially just a reversion Survivor format with celebrities. So I ended up fighting that case in the UK and the US. And through that, I kind of became Mr. Format. How common an issue is it, do you think, format theft by broadcasters, by other producers, by other people within the industry? But it's commonly by broadcasters, I, I seem to think. Is, is that right? And how common is it? I regret to say that it is much more common than it should be. Broadcasters, especially those who have a public service obligation, such as Channel 4 and the Beeb, should be properly applying principles of intellectual property, which are there to, for their own protection, not only for that of the industry as a whole. I mean, we won't get great music, great sculpture, great paintings if the, the, the law of copyright is not observed. But sadly, despite that, there are instances where people pitch ideas in whatever degree of formed versions that they put forward. They pitch ideas to the broadcasters, and one way or another, they get told we're not interested, but sometime later the broadcaster produces something strikingly similar. Well, that's the, the question, isn't it? And, and, and it seems to be pretty much all of the producers that we've spoken to for this show have essentially found a, a very similar situation to that. How can they more effectively protect their ideas? Because that's that's the, the key issue, isn't it? That the, There doesn't seem to be any, any protection and, and there's this reluctance of course for a business to bite the hand that feeds it in terms of taking up an issue against a broadcaster well justin you're right you, you've hit on two issues i'll take them one at a time the law of copyright is the ideal form of protecting television formats the problem is that it doesn't naturally fit a tv format particularly a reality format it doesn't naturally fit into the orthodox ways that you think of as copyright material. You know, it's not like a stage play, which has turned into a TV program or a movie or a quiz show. All of these things are relatively easy to protect compared to the plethora that we've seen over the last 20 years of reality TV shows. To give an, you know, an example, Big Brother, you essentially could say, well, you just gather a bunch of people into a building, you feed them, you shove a load of cameras around them, and that you edit and transmit comes out the cameras. I mean, that is, in a sense, the thinnest possible format. But as we know, Big Brother has made gazillions all the way around the world. One of the reasons why is because its owners have gone to every country and stamped their foot. But where an idea is pitched, 
in whatever form, I, either orally or more commonly in, in a you know, one page pitch document, then it's more difficult because probably the copyright fairy has not waved her wand over that sufficiently to make it protectable in copyright. Now, in situations where the idea has been pitched and it is a new idea has not been transmitted, the way that you protect that is through what we call breach of confidence. And there is an old case called Fraser and Thames Television about a format for a drama series which establishes that the courts will protect an idea which is pitched in in more or less any form if the court regards it as an idea which merits protection and has some commercial value. The law will normally imply a duty of confidence in a pitch situation, and there is legal authority for that too. What I always advise clients to do is very gently in the the pitch document, they may do that anyway, you know, we have something like, you know, you will understand that this idea hasn't seen the light of day, it's very confidential to us at the moment, and we send it to you on the understanding that you will treat it as confidential. The court will have no problem after that in ascribing it the protection that breach of confidence gives. Now, the thing about breach of confidence is that it will protect an idea which the law of copyright will not. So, in principle, in a pitch situation, you should have a legal remedy. That's first issue that you've raised. The second issue, of course, is a commercial one. Who wants to take on a major broadcaster because you think that they have pinched one of your ideas? I mean, it may be commercial suicide to do it. And that creates the most enormous dilemma. You may, at one in one uh, sense, think this is the absolutely the best TV format since sliced bread. It's the new who wants to be a millionaire or whatever. It's going to make gazillions of pounds. On the other hand, you may think, well, if I make a fuss or instruct lawyers, then it may be that this broadcast won't ever commission a single program that I offer them between here and eternity. And that is the most extraordinary dilemma to try and resolve. We heard that from one of our producers, didn't we, when they didn't want to be tarred with the brush of being the awkward producer or the litiginous producer or, you know, the producer that's troublesome. That's clearly a pretty unhealthy balance of power right there, right? It's an immensely unhealthy balance of power. Unfortunately, you know, it does reflect the world that we live in. And you know, in a sense, the theft of intellectual property is is not the sole preserve, as you know, of the TV industry. I've done intellectual property work in a much wider range, in, you know, computer programs, music, you name it, more or less. It's what we lawyers call soft IP. It's not, you know, it's not mechanics, it's not patents and that kind of thing. But what we should have is a proper body that will deal with these disputes and to some extent we do of course there's there's frapper which has a dispute resolution service but the problem with that is is that it it's entirely voluntary only and if a broadcaster says well no i deny that i've stolen your program idea uh, and i'm not going to waste my time dealing with frapper because you know you what you what you say isn't true and then you're left with the option of trying to hire a lawyer. Now, I've been on both sides of legal disputes concerning television formats, and they're not inexpensive. You know, you have to use top flight lawyers. Uh, otherwise, you haven't got no, any chance of winning. You've got uh, top flight barristers and solicitors, and these aren't cheap. And a fully fledged trial, um, I've done a, you know, a, a one particular one for Channel 4, is not an inexpensive process. And all of that time, of course, if you're suing a broadcaster, you can absolutely guarantee that they're not they're not going to commission you and they may never commission you again. So it is it is a deep, deep dilemma for folk. Give me an idea of, of, of costs then. Would you say, I mean I know that's uh, that's how long is a piece of string, but you're talking about hundreds of thousands of pounds in legal costs to take on a, a broadcaster. Yes you are. If they want to fight you hard, then getting to a trial is not going to give you much change out of half a million. And you may think that's an awful lot, but there is a great deal that needs to be done. And any decent litigator will tell you that their chances of winning for their client are much improved if you're very, very thorough in your preparation. Now, the the, um, additional risk is this. 
is that if you go to a court and the law concerning the protection of formats is much, much better than it was when I started out 20 odd years or probably 25 years ago now. But it's there's still areas of uncertainty. So the risk may be that you then lose, which means you're going to play a, pay approximately 75 percent of the other side's costs, which you know, can mean you're the wrong end of the, the best part of a million quid. Well, even some of the larger indies are really going to feel that in their accounts. Clearly, it's a dispute that nobody really wants in the first place, right? Nobody wants that. What does interest me is that, you know, we we use technology for all aspects of content production and uh, content creation, except around this initial creative spark that the creatives that fuel the TV industry have. Surely there's a way to use technology for producers to be able to, I don't know, digitally register and and protect their ideas? Is there no way that we can see a similar sort of even like a digital post box for their ideas? Is that something that we could ever see developed, do you think, that could be effective in this area? I think it would be a very good thing. It does exist. Frapper, at least last time I checked with them, does have a system whereby you can digitally record it's a little bit like you know youngsters forming bands will used to make a cassette tape of their best tunes and send it to them themselves by registered post and then not open the 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 packet and it's roughly the same principle if you register at frapper but the problem justin still remains is that it, it, it may well mean many times a client has come to me and showed me all the evidence without having to register you know they 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 show me the email and in it a you know, pitch document, a nice, carefully thought out pitch document, which makes it absolutely clear what the nature is of the show. And then they say, you know, log on to iPlayer or something like that. And, and when anyone who's got any experience of the, the television industry can see that that is their show, you know, gone either globally or, or worse still, obviously globally, because then, of course, you lose market abroad or at least from the UK and of course the the, the thing is with UK's preeminence in this field it normally starts here and then in the moment it starts to do well out go the the broadcasters desperately trying to 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 sell it but you know there it's it's not a question of whether I can prove that they've stolen that the the idea in many cases I can the problem is a that you don't want to bite the hand that feeds you, and B, the other side have a war chest which is many, many times the size yours is. So it, it's not often a question of proof. It's normally just a question of resources and commercial reality. So it seems there are steps that producers can take to protect their ideas, but perhaps those are still massively outweighed by that commercial reality and the legal resources that commissioning companies have at their disposal. I caught up with John McVeigh, CEO of the UK's indie producers trade body, Pact, to get his take on the scale of the problem and what their members are saying on the issue. Uh, I would say it's common uh, and frequent, and certainly on my over my 21 years at Pact, this issue is a regular concern for producers when they're uh, pitching new ideas into some broadcasters, I wouldn't say all broadcasters, or indeed streamers, but it's a common and frequent concern. So the members are raising this with you as an issue on a fairly regular basis? Yeah, I would say it's something we we deal with. Uh, We consult with our members if they come to us with a concern or a complaint about how they've been treated or how their ideas have been maybe maybe been appropriated by buyers or indeed sometimes uh, uh, what is often upsetting maybe other producers as they see it and then we'll we'll give them advice on what their options are what action they may want to take but it's up to them where to decide what to do we won't act for members without their explicit permission on any issues like that from the indies that we've spoken to and also other indies that I've been speaking to in over the past few months around this similar issue that it is pretty widespread but you know the actual number of indies understandably that take this up as an issue is is a a tiny percentage of of the cases of which there, there seems to be a problem one of our contributors earlier on said that you know maybe as a smaller indie when there's a small business small medium-sized enterprise do you think that sort of business is more at risk 
of IP theft by a broadcaster or a streamer than maybe a more influential indie as part of you know one of those bigger production groups. Do you get the sense that it's the smaller indie is more at risk? Uh, no, we've been involved in a number of complaints on the actions that have been taken by producers on this issue over the years, and, and it's raised, you know, it's been from small companies to larger companies. I mean, I think larger companies clearly have access to maybe more fiscal resource in order to instruct lawyers to write a letter, take action, raise the issue. Uh, and of course, their relationship with more, maybe more senior people in the um, buyers uh, may be more influential and providing with, uh, if you want, a lot more respect in terms of how they're treated. You know, we deal with members, uh, small and medium, who feel they are often, uh, if you want, bullied uh, by buyers um, on a whole range of issues, not just on this one. So, uh, and that that's a complete that reflects really, really badly on the broadcasters concerned because one, they should be encouraging those suppliers, they should be respecting their IP, they should be respecting them in their business dealings um, because they are also uh, IP creators themselves generally. Uh, and if you want to have people respect your own IP, then you've got to respect others' IP. Um, that's the fundamental issue. You can't have, you know, your cake and eat it. You've basically got to make sure that your corporate principles are that if you're an IP owner creator, then you respect other IP owner creators and you should have systems and checks in place and commissioning to make sure that people feel that they're fairly treated, that their ideas are safe. If you don't, then what will happen is those suppliers may not bring their best ideas to you. So that's not good business. You want to encourage great ideas with great talent to come to you as a potential buyer if you have a reputation that you can't be trusted uh, or you don't deal fairly with people then they may take their ideas elsewhere and that's bad for your business it's it's interesting isn't it? because we see a number of you know people on the buying side of broadcasters often seem to be move in and out of the indie sector as well so you know i, I think there's a certain uh, element of what comes around goes around as well because i guess that a lot of indies are speaking to each other and knowing uh, perhaps the culprits that are, that are at work in this area. I mean, clearly the power sits very heavily on one side of this transaction when it comes to an indie with an idea, pitching this idea and creating these shows for broadcasters. And many of these indies have, sp- have spent many hours in development. And sometimes we heard earlier on, you know, actually investing in taster tapes, et cetera. Is there any more that can be done? Because this is just, it seems that the chips are, are balanced so heavily in the favour of the broadcaster. Is it something that we just have to say, this is how it's always been and how it will be going forward? Or do you think there's anything more that actually can be done to protect the creative ideas of indies when it comes to pitching? The, the power is always vested in commissioners. They have the money. Um, they, they choose who will be commissioned or not be commissioned. Uh, so they've always had the power, and that, that's uh, always been the, the case and always will be the case. If you're a supplier, you're trying to uh, convince that buyer that you've got the best idea, that you can execute it, that you can deliver what they need for their, their business. Uh, so the power always sits with people who have money. However, power should be abused. Power should be respected. And uh, people should respect um, people, uh, suppliers coming to them with ideas in good faith, in trust. That trust must be respected. We do not, as a creative industry, uh, where we trade in ideas and creativity, we don't really want to end up in a situation in other industries or indeed often in America where you have to sign an NDA where all those processes come in, you want a free flow of ideas. And indeed, a good relationship with a good, respectful commissioning editor is a good thing for suppliers. Ideas can be made better. They can be improved upon. They can be helped. They can be nurtured. And you want to have that sort of trusting environment. Uh, And any broadcaster that doesn't think that's important is uh, really missing the point when there are more buyers uh, in the market uh, there are more opportunities in the market. As I said earlier, if you are focused on this in terms of trying to secure the best talent and the best ideas, then someone else will be. Essentially, we've really got to just rely on the broadcasters and the, the streamers. No, we don't have to rely on them. I, th- I, th- I think, you know, as I said, we've acted for members on this when they've instructed us to do so. 
Um, generally, you know, that's not something that people do lightly. Uh, it's not something people really want to do because this is a relationship business. It is about uh, maintaining good relations. Uh, I don't think it should be a case of suck it up. But I think all broadcasters uh, should basically make clear as part of their overall, and, you know, some do, that they will respect people's IP, that they won't be looking to pass it on, and that they won't be looking to, um, you know, when someone walks out the door, then phone the talent and try and make the idea directly with the talent. Um, that those things are old school and really reprehensible. And as I say, while there isn't data, this has been a perennial problem for some broadcasters, for some commissioners. And I think it's up to the the heads of those, of those commissioning teams to stamp it out. Is there any common code of conduct that acquirers of content, whether it's commissioners, that all have to abide by? No, there isn't, there isn't an industry-wide one, to my knowledge. I mean, each broadcaster has made clear their position and their statements. If they are fulfilling their statements, then that's something that, you know, we, we would pull them up about. You know, if we had members... And we've done this before, a while ago, with one, one broadcaster where we had to go and privately see the director of television and, and lay out the number of complaints uh, and ask them to do something about it. Yeah, so clearly there's, there's uh, egregious actions taken by some commissioners, but then there's also a grey area, and we've dealt with some of these before, and it might be in a current affairs or a comedy type setup where a number of very similar ideas often based on topical events will arrive inside a broadcaster and I think that's just um, uh, an inevitable consequence of having a large creative community where people will often come up with quite similar ideas but I don't think that's the same as uh, ideas being passed on or ripped off but we have also had to navigate some issues like that before and they're much more difficult because you know, an in-house team may come up with an idea very similar to an indie's idea and very similar to another indie's idea. So I think they're, they're in a, they sit in a different place. So clearly there is the possibility in such a creative industry driven by ideas, trends and the media agenda that two or more producers, whether they're an indie or an in-house at a broadcaster, can have the same idea at the same time. And that's just how it is. But equally, there seems to be a lot of evidence to suggest that there are buyers of creative ideas in broadcasters and streamers who may not be playing entirely by the rules. And I'm not for a minute suggesting that any broadcasters or platforms are knowingly pursuing a policy of TV idea appropriation. But it does seem that there may be some, maybe just a few, individuals out there who are not following best practice when it comes to commissioning shows and supporting creative talent and their ideas. As we discussed in the show, maybe there's some ways technology can help better protect the creatives that drive the industry. Or maybe there needs to be a voluntary charter or a more defined set of common standards that all commissioning companies can sign up to to tighten things up. Either way, it seems like it's about time that there was a rebalance when it comes to the producer-commissioner relationship, particularly as IP is becoming ever more valuable in the current production boom. Well, that's about it for this week's show. Don't forget to rate and subscribe to Telecast and share it with friends and colleagues. And if you enjoyed this kind of show where we're looking into issues in the industry... Let me know at justin at telecast.com and we look to do some more shows like this. We've got a brand new website that includes exclusive feature content from TV's opinion leaders and journalists. They're all free to access. Just sign up at telecast.com. And while you're there, why not sign up for our free newsletter, Telecast Plus? You can also follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. Telecast was edited by Ian Chambers and recorded in London. Until next week's show, as always, stay safe.